Um, with that, I'd like to introduce our first plenary speaker, Anthony. Nijanitos is the director of the Frederick S. Pardee Center for the Study of Longer Range Future and the Pardee Professor of Earth and Environment at Boston University. And his talk is entitled Longer Term Lessons from the National Climate Assessment, of which he was one of the authors. Uh, uh, Judy, thank you very much. And uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to, uh, to come uh, talk with you all, to speak with you all this morning. <coughs> uh, I'm going to talk about some of the lessons from the uh, recently released third Nas U.S. National Climate Assessment uh, that you heard referred to just, uh, just a few minutes ago. Um, as Judy said, I was uh, on the steering committee uh, and also was one of the authors, actually, along with uh, my colleague uh, here at MIT, Jake Jacoby. Uh, we led a chapter on, uh, on mitigation. Uh, which I'm actually not going to talk about very much. Uh, but what I, what I do want to do is share some of the uh, overall findings and, and main lessons uh, from the National Climate Assessment, primarily focusing on impacts uh, and, uh, and adaptation. Uh, the first thing is that we really have moved from discussing climate change uh, and the impacts of changes in the physical climate system uh, as an issue that will affect our children and our children's children to one that is affecting people now. There's really very little uh, scientific question that that's what's, that, that we are beginning to see uh, the impacts of change and variability in the physical climate system driven by our own activities. So this is an issue for today, not simply an issue uh, for future generations. Uh, and we are, in fact, already feeling the effects of some of the increases um, in at least some types of severe uh, extreme weather uh, and sea level rise. Parking is really a terrible thing uh, in many cities. Uh, but, uh, and apparently sea level rise makes it worse. Um, and, and in fact, impacts are beginning to be apparent really across the country. Uh, and, and this really echoes findings from, for example, IPCC, uh, it's uh, the latest uh, Working Group 2 report, which is on impacts uh, and adaptation, uh, has a similar message uh, for the globe. And we are seeing this now um, in the U.S. Uh, as well. Uh, there are, on the other hand, many actions that we can take, um, both to begin to reduce carbon footprints, um, but also to increase our preparedness uh, and to adapt to those changes that are already inevitable. So uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, some of the, a little bit about some of the evidence about the physical climate system. Uh, uh, I'm not going to go into this in, in any great detail. There are numerous independent lines of evidence showing that the, uh, that we are in fact seeing a consistent uh, change in the, in the physical climate system. Uh, there's all kinds of natural variability on different time scales. We are, after all, talking about climate and not weather. Uh, and, uh, and, and of course, there's geographic variability as well. But when you look um, overall, uh, the blue and the red are the anomalies for uh, global temperature change. This is actually in degrees Fahrenheit um, since we created this assessment primarily for uh, communicating with uh, U.S. policymakers. Uh, the black line is what we've done to CO2 concentrations. I'm going to come back to that uh, in a minute. Uh, and if you look at change in uh, surface temperature decade by decade, uh, we've, we essentially have a series of increasingly warmer decades um, in the uh, uh, late 20th and early 21st century. Um, we've, of course, seen Arctic sea ice decline. Uh, this actually does not have, this is, this is floating ice, this does not have any effect uh, on sea level rise. But one of the really interesting features of this uh, is that this phenomenon is happening much faster than any of the, any of the models expected it to do. Um, and so we're, we're faced with significant uncertainties um, in the physical climate system. They don't all break our way. Uh, this, however, does have an effect on sea level rise. This is the actual loss of mass um, from NASA's GRACE uh, gravity retrieval mission um, from landed ice, both in Greenland uh, and Antarctica. Uh, and it's quite clear that human activities 
um, are the primary cause, particularly over the last 100 or so years. Uh, this is what, um, these are the contributions from uh, fossil fuel, uh, combustion, and cement manufacturing uh, for since about the middle of the 19th century, uh, broken down essentially by fuel type. Uh, this is a pretty dramatic change. This is well outside of any geologically recent experience uh, that, we've, uh, that we've had. Uh, and we're now at a point where atmospheric concentrations in, uh, of CO2 are flirting with the 400 parts per million range. Uh, typical measurements for most of the interglacial periods are 280, 285 parts per million. So we're well outside of the uh, natural background. Um, and in the U.S., um, the, uh, even though we have some uh, natural sinks, primarily due to land use, uh, they, at most, they account for sort of on order 13 to 16 or 17 percent um, of the fossil fuel sources. So uh, we are substantially changing the composition um, and the radiative character of the atmosphere. Future change um, will depend primarily on what we do to the atmosphere. Uh, on, in, on what we do in terms of releasing greenhouse gases. And the impacts that we're already beginning to see are actually projected uh, to increase. Um, if you look uh, simply at temperature, in, in, the, in the national assessment, we looked at two different potential scenarios of uh, a high, essentially a high and a low scenario of change. These are actually uh, taken from uh, uh, IPCC generated uh, scenarios um, from a number of years ago uh, called the ESRA. These are two of the family of ESRES scenarios. Um, and they provide not a project, not a prediction, but they provide, in a sense, an envelope of, of uh, giving us some capability to compare uh, what a world of very high emissions and a world of more moderate emissions might look like. Um, and the degree to which they would be uh, different. Um, and one way in which they might be different is, to, is what the consequences might be for sea level rise. This graph combines uh, old proxy records with tide gauge data um, with a much more recent and shorter satellite uh, data record, um, and then projections forward. Uh, but this does not include uh, the potential consequences of destabilization of the, uh, of the big uh, West Antarctic or Greenland ice sheets. So this is simply uh, thermal expansion. And even with that, you can see we have, a, we have a, quite a range of potential global uh, sea level rises by, uh, by the end of the century. Um, if you look more locally, um, this is uh, a picture for the, uh, for the East Coast. Um, the insert is, I think, Philadelphia. Um, we just saw the, the, the equivalent picture for Boston. Um, all up and down the, the, the northeast, um, you'll see similar uh, pictures. Um, and uh, they're already leading to, uh, to fairly widespread impacts. This is a coastal road actually in coastal Virginia. Um, and, uh, and sea level rise is not the only issue. In the western part of the country, um, in arid and semi-arid regions, um, we're already seeing uh, increases in water stress. Um, as we've had pr uh, protracted droughts um, through much of that, much of that area. Um, and nationally, we're seeing uh, decreases in heating demand, largely in the, in the cold months, um, and increases in cooling demand, uh, uh, creating much more uh, demand for electricity during the summer months. Uh, typical, in, in some places, we're seeing high tides um, that are uh, uh, particularly associated with uh, uh, occasionally with storm events, but, but even in a sense sort of ordinary high tides are starting to be severe enough in many places that they're, uh, that they're problematic. Um, and if you look, uh, this was, uh, again, out of the coastal chapter for the national assessment, um, this probability of shoreline erosion of more than about three feet per year, about a meter per year, um, and the probability scale um, on the bottom, and if you look at the, the U.S. southeast uh, and then up the eastern seaboard, uh, until you get up into the rocky coasts of, uh, of Maine, 
uh, you have quite substantial probability of erosion of more than a meter per year um, over, this, uh, over these next several decades. Contrast that with the western part, uh, the west coast, where the probability of that much erosion is really uh, relatively low, um, with only a few exceptions. Uh, and, and the kinds of resources that are now being placed at risk um, is not only uh, sort of natural ecosystems and agricultural systems and sort of the biological systems on which we depend, but it's starting to be as well the built infrastructure. So these, um, these were the paths of uh, Hurricanes Rita and Katrina um, from a, a few years ago, and all these red dots um, are oil and natural gas platforms. Uh, and in fact, these hurricanes, in particular Katrina, um, knocked out a substantial fraction of natural gas uh, supplies, both because of interfering with the platforms, but also because of interfering with the port uh, of New Orleans. And uh, for several months, there was a spike in prices, um, as you might have, might have expected. Um, but this is, this is the kind of infrastructure vulnerability um, that I think we now are in the position of needing to think about very, very carefully. Um, uh, the U.S. Geological Survey uh, produces an index of vulnerability to sea level rise. Uh, this is what the Gulf and uh, uh, the southeast part of the U.S. up to Virginia Beach uh, look like. Um, without any, there's no great surprise here that the highest levels of vulnerability are, uh, are in the Gulf around New Orleans where you have this combination of a rise in sea level and substantial subsidence um, at the same time. Uh, around Miami, uh, where you've already got uh, the ocean essentially bubbling up through, the, through, the, through limestone, and in the ports of Charleston and Virginia Beach. Virginia Beach is particularly interesting uh, because it is the site of the largest naval facility in the world uh, with billions of dollars of infrastructure um, and a major investment um, from, uh, uh, from the U.S. Navy uh, for, uh, for its ports, uh, for its operations. Uh, just, just actually, this study was on uh, transportation in the Gulf was actually uh, begun before Katrina, interrupted by Katrina, um, and then finished afterwards. But um, one of the things that they did was an analysis that was, uh, in a sense, similar to the one that Nancy just showed you for Boston as to how much, uh, what fraction of the transportation infrastructure was actually, actually vulnerable to, uh, to inundation. Um, in this case, um, they used about four feet as their criterion. Um, this light blue shaded area is all before, below four feet elevation. The, the impacts of climate change in particular, I think, threaten the well-being of, of urban residents. The U.S. is, is uh, close to 90 percent urbanized, uh, and there's a, lot, there's a tremendous amount of essential infrastructure, um, water, energy supply, uh, transportation, which can be compromised um, by these interrelated uh, impacts. Uh, the, uh, one of the big challenges in urban settings is the interrelationship of these, of these different infrastructures. There's no such thing as sort of one infrastructure. Um, and uh, this diagram, which was uh, adapted from uh, uh, a National Laboratory report, uh, essentially shows some of the relationships between um, energy infrastructure, uh, the electric power, communications, transportation, um, and the service economy. Um, showing you where some of these links are. If you lose power, um, you know, it's not just that the lights go out. The ATM machines don't work. The subway doesn't run. Uh, so you lose transportation services um, and financial services as well. Um, if you've got water uh, coming up over spillways and around, uh, 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 around uh, uh, fortifications and, and over dams, um, again, affects infrastructure, um, it affects, or excuse me, affects, affects transportation, um, it affects services. Um, each one of these stresses, in a sense, ripples through um, an entire urban system. And then the last point I want to make is that uh, this issue of heat. Nancy brought this up, and this is incredibly important. Um, in this graph, what we've done is compare, uh, these are the, the, the number of days 
above 90, 90 degrees Fahrenheit um, in a year. So this is historical climate. This was historical from uh, 1970 to 2000, uh, so about the 2000 uh, climate normals. Um, and under a lower emission, and so these two graphs represent uh, the cal calculations for different emission scenarios um, for the late 21st century. Um, I think this is 2040 to about 2070, um, whoops, averaged. Um, and, and in the lower emission scenario, um, you still see uh, a substantial increase across the same area for the number of days um, above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. For the higher emission scenario, um, uh, this, is, uh, this is not quite uh, frying an egg on the sidewalk, um, but it's getting pretty close. And uh, you think about what the city feels like when it's above 90 Fahrenheit, um, it's, uh, it's pretty uncomfortable, and for many people, it's dangerous. Uh, and so without, uh, at, without adequate preparation, um, in fact, either of these two scenarios can present some substantial challenges, particularly uh, to especially vulnerable uh, populations. So what might one do? The, uh, there are, there are, I think there are important coping strategies um, and opportunities to, uh, to respond. Um, John Holdren, the President's Science Advisor, um, talks about having three possible responses. Um, you can mitigate, you can prepare, or you can suffer. Uh, they're not independent. Um, the, uh, the mitigation challenge um, is, is fascinating. There are many cities, Boston being amongst the leaders, that have taken substantial steps to try to reduce their carbon footprint. One of the really interesting things that, that we're beginning to see in cities that have taken this seriously is that they've already wrung a lot of the easy stuff out of the system. Changing bus fleets and taxi fleets to natural gas or to hybrids. Uh, 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 not, not as many cities have gone as far, for example, as London with really making, trying to make uh, automobile traffic in the, in the city center um, either forbidden or prohibitively expensive. Um, but uh, putting up, uh, uh, going to, uh, to renewables, whether it's solar or wind. Um, getting, the next, getting the next share of emissions out of the system is going to be hard, uh, in part uh, because they, it starts to deal with the underlying fabric of how we actually produce and generate, uh, generate electricity regionally um, and nationally. But there are many activities going on at local levels, at municipal levels, at state um, and regional levels. And we're now just beginning to see the first, uh, in the US, um, the first attempts at a national uh, regulatory uh, policy. And we'll have to see how that, uh, how that works out. Uh, the second category of responses is adaptation. And there are uh, these, and, and there are many different kinds of adaptation responses, uh, making sure that, in, in a sense, that culverts are actually big enough to, to, uh, to manage uh, uh, combined uh, sewer water outflows. Um, in some parts of the southeast, um, we're actually seeing when rebuilding occurs, we're seeing people put their houses up. Um, uh, Nancy talked about a number of the things that, that Boston itself is trying to do, and in particular, requiring new development to actually take climate change and sea level rise um, into account. Uh, but one of the, one of the conclusions from, for the national assessment is that while there are many, many adaptation plans in place, we have relatively little information on effectiveness of adaptation actions, partly because uh, the, the fraction of planning is much larger than the uh, places that have actually uh, gone to the stage of implementation, and partly because everything is new. Uh, we just don't have a very, a very long track record yet of the cost effectiveness of different uh, adaptation uh, actions. Um, there are some indications, for example, in New York that the damage from Sandy was substantially less than it would have been had New York not already taken um, a whole series of adaptation actions. Boston's preparedness uh, will no doubt 
serve it well um, in the unhappy event that, that we experience something like uh, something like Sandy or, or a succession of uh, extreme events like that. But overall, we're in this stage right now for adaptation of a, tre a tremendous amount of experimentation um, and planning actions um, with the expectation that they will be effective and successful. Uh, but we need to have uh, both a better, a better sense of what we can accomplish through engineering and a better sense of how we can embed adaptation practices and strategies um, in municipal planning um, in, in the fabric of decisions that we all make uh, every day. So with that, I think I'd like to end. Uh, and thank you for your attention. I'm happy to. Do, you have, do we have time for a few questions? It's, it's, all the, it's all those um, sustainable croissants. <laughs> they were really good, though. <laughs> oh, there's one over here. Thank you. My name's Craig Kelly. I'm a city councilor here in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And we have two different things going on in terms of resilience planning. One, we have this study of net zero building. Mm -hmm. And the other, we have a MAPC funded or provided study of climate change vulnerability. And when you start talking about four feet or five feet of sea level rise, the immediate thought is we shouldn't be building anything here. Um, so, you know, everyone says pick it up and move it to the Berkshires. And as a planner, that's a really difficult thing to accept. So where do we go in this conversation to figure out what is possible and what is politically viable? And you know, are we wasting our time on things like net zero in Cambridge when we ought to be building 100 feet higher? Well, uh, I, I hope we don't have to be building 100 feet higher. I just bought a place in City Point. I'm at 40 feet above sea level. So 100 feet is, is, would be a challenge. Um, the, there are, one of the things that I think is important in, in this kind of planning is to um, use the, use, one is to use the scenarios in, a, in the way in which they're actually intended. They're not predictions of exactly how the future will unfold. Partly, they have scientific uncertainty embedded in them. You look at this one to four feet global mean sea level rise, for example. Secondly, they're also dependent on what we actually do to the atmosphere, and that, that is, of course, up to us um, in terms of, of emissions. Uh, the third thing is that it's not necessarily a function of preventing all harm. It's also, uh, we, we need to be considering uh, how we actually respond to events uh, that, that we're not going to be able to prevent. It seems highly unreasonable to me for Boston and Cambridge uh, to somehow magically uh, move to Worcester um, and, uh, and, and sort of away from the, away from the ocean. Um, you know, where I, I actually grew up in, in uh, Hampton Beach, uh, for those of you who know the lovely New Hampshire seacoast, and, and what happens on the New Hampshire seacoast is that about every 10 years there's a storm that's big enough and sort of nasty enough to tear up the seawall, tear up Route 1A, uh, throw a bunch of stuff across to the other side of the road, and generally make a, a real mess of things. Right now, it, what really makes sense economically and politically for those communities is to rebuild, right? There's, there's, you can get resources to rebuild, you can get revenue to rebuild, but if the frequency of storms that, of that magnitude starts to increase, at some, at some point those resources just aren't available. They're not available in state budgets, they're not available through, through insurance uh, compensation. And so what would make sense in, in that environment would be to start to plan for what does, what does recovery look like? And what does recovery look like when events become more frequent? Um, and do we have to, to do something alternative, whether it's, it's uh, uh, beachfront replenishment, whether it's higher seawalls, um, whether it's, it's coastal uh, uh, um, ecological restoration of the marshes to absorb, uh, absorb wave energy, um, and, and, and things like that. Uh, it, it might make sense, for example, to be thinking about 
um, adaptation in terms of, uh, in a sense, chunks of decades? What would you do uh, to increase your resilience for the next 40 years, given the average lifespan of the, uh, of the hard infrastructure? Um, so I think there's no one answer, um, but I, I wouldn't let the prospect of potential changes 100, 150 years out impede planning for today and uh, protecting resources for the next several decades. Uh, in the back. Uh, Charlotte Kahn, formerly with the Boston Indicators Project. There seems to be a huge disconnect between what people are planning for the next few years or even decades and what we just heard. So for example, in the Globe yesterday, there was uh, coverage of a plan to bring the, the Olympics to Boston, endorsed by the Boston Globe. The legislature just uh, seems on the verge of approving the expansion of the convention center, which is located in what looks to be the inundation district of Boston. Um, and you know, the, the XL pipeline about which there's a lot of controversy would take all of this, uh, you know, the, the tar sands into just the area that you were just showing us is going to be subject to hurricane damage on the Gulf Coast. Is, you know, are you, are others sitting down with people making decisions right now about those kinds of things? Because it seems like, you know, entirely different universes of decision making. And how do we cut through that membrane so that people are you know, sort of on the same page about what we're facing? Yeah, this is, this is a really important question. Um, I think we've gone through a number of years where um, essentially what we've seen are the scientific community um, and a few places uh, you know, sort of take these issues in the underlying science very seriously and start to put together adaptation plans. Um, that has not been the case broadly right, in, in the U.S. Um, f last year, for the first time, uh, in the, the president started, released an executive order instructing all the federal agencies uh, to actually put together climate adaptation plans um, and sustainability plans and to begin to factor changes in the physical climate system into their actual operations. Uh, so for some agencies, the natural resource agencies, um, this, is a, this is a real challenge. Uh, for other, other agencies, in, in particular departments of transportation, health and human services, uh, they're, they're in very early stages for how they, how they actually approach this problem. It's, 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 it's really something that's new for them. So I think some of those barriers are starting to come down, um, but, but they're not gone. And, and uh, and I think that this will, this is sort of one issue that um, is clearly taking some time to sort of penetrate how uh, uh, federal agencies, state agencies, uh, municipal authorities actually conduct, uh, conduct their business. Got one here, and then I'll go over there. Do you know whether the models for tidal surge and inundation take into account structures, man-made structures, buildings, for instance, uh, getting back to the first question, mm -hmm. as we continue to build and build more densely, are we going to be worsening the inundation or worsening the surge of effect in the city? I don't know the answer to that. I suspect the next speaker might. <laughs> yeah. Um, my name is Hubert Murray. I'm an architect. Um, and just to sort of go back to today, which is about this, the science and the science of communication or communication mm -hmm. science. And just look, looking at um, the graphs that you presented us, uh, so for instance, the, the global average of sea level mm -hmm. rise is predicted between one and four feet. And I'm wondering if that is a helpful type of communication because actually it, I believe it is very regional and whether it is uh, more helpful to actually look at the, the ranges of regions uh, that are going to be affected by sea level rise. And this might apply also to heat and other mm -hmm. indicators. Well, um, 
that's that's a real that's a really important point. The um, which is partly why I showed you the graphs for for the eastern seaboard and and because you know adaptation is not about so much adapting to global means or 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 global averages. It's about dealing with um, your understanding of the situation today in your place. This is part of the reason why the, in the U.S. the Gulf Coast is so vulnerable because you not only have this mean sea level rise, but you have extremely rapid land subsidence. Uh, the, the dynamic, coastal dynamics here in the Northeast are quite different. Um, the, uh, one of the offshoots of the National Climate Assessment process um, that actually I've been quite heavily involved with um, is the development of a national system of indicators uh, for not only changes in the physical climate system, but for impacts and for response strategies. Uh, and so we've worked now over the past three years with uh, several hundred scientists and experts to develop a suite of indicators that begin to establish a baseline, track changes over time, uh, that have some historical records to them. There are some phenomena that scientifically, in a sense, only make sense to talk about globally, or at least you have to talk about them globally before you can make much sense of regional patterns. Sea level rise is one. Um, surface, average surface temperature changes are another. Um, but, and so the way we are structuring this indicators effort is we'll have a handful of essentially global indicators, uh, but then everything else um, is much more at, at sort of regional and local scales. Um, we're completely transparent about methodologies and data sources so that, they, so that it can actually be adapted uh, to local cir circumstances. Um, the plan there is to have a pilot system rolled out this summer uh, and, uh, and then do a set of evaluation studies in the pilot system and then have a full launch of, the, of a much more comprehensive uh, system of indicators in roughly a year's time. So I, uh, we certainly take your point. And I, I think that we'll probably uh, stop here because we'd like you to come back from the break a few minutes early, say um, 10, 20, I believe, right? So that we have some time for the panel discussion after our next uh, speakers, set of speakers. And what I'd like to do uh, with uh, offer uh, Anthony <laughs> the opportunity to talk to people one-on-one -on -one sure. if you have more Glad questions, if that's okay with you. So thank you very much. Thank you.